Welcome everyone uh, to this episode of On the Front Lines. Uh, we are here today with Natasha Badwar from Karbaim Mohabbat. Uh, today's episode is about, uh, you know, uh, feeding uh, the entire population uh, of migrants who are stuck across the country uh, in various states and the challenges around them. Uh, and Natasha is going to speak about that. But before we start, uh, I wanted to let the audience know that we are live streaming on Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, and Twitch. Uh, so uh, across all these live stream formats, you can send in your questions in the comments, and uh, you know we can we can ask those questions to Natasha. Um, so welcome, Natasha. Thank you so much for welcome. joining us. Welcome. Right. Uh, so the Karwai Mohabbat was formed, uh, in, you know, about three years ago uh, in response to the rising intolerance in the country, uh, especially around the lynchings and the communal divide that was building uh, across uh, the citizens uh, due, to, due to various sort of political circumstances, social circumstances. Um, and it was with the idea to spread love. Uh, today, uh, you're distributing meals to people who are hungry. So what led you to do this and, and what was the thinking behind this? So um, the Karwani Mohabbat uh, was a call, a campaign call that was given by Harsh Mandar in, about, in August 2017. And uh, this was in response to the rising hate crimes, hate speech, and the number of lynchings that had begun to happen in the country, starting from the lynching of Akhlaq in Dadri 2015, and right up to the lynching of Pehlu Khan and Junaid in 2017. And um, at that time, um, Harsh had, uh, uh, you know, it was the time that many other civil societies, uh, civil society groups also uh, began to campaign uh, against hate speech and hate crimes, because we were in a situation <clears throat> where not only were these ghastly crimes taking place, uh, we were also in a, in a time and place when the state was actually criminalizing the victim himself, uh, that he must have done something wrong. He probably deserved to be lynched in this manner and glorifying and creating a hero out of those people who on video, in most cases, had attacked a man in a broad uh, you know, and, and it was a targeting of Muslims. So it looked, it seemed to be a pattern. That pattern was something that we wanted to call out. And so the Karwani Mohabbat was crafted as a journey uh, of solidarity through the homes of people who had been victimized by hate crimes. We, uh, we thought it would be a one-time thing for the first uh, four months. Uh, we went from state to state, home to home. And uh, we wrote their stories, we offered legal help, uh, we offered uh, psychosocial care. And uh, when we thought it might uh, peter off because we had covered the number of crimes that had taken place, we actually found that they were, there was a rise in the number of crimes, in the number of lynchings taking place, which continued uh, right up till the end of the first term of the Modi government. And uh, by the time uh, you know the new uh, session started, the government came back in 2019. We were looking at Assam NRC, uh, which looked like a systematic exclusion of uh, Muslims uh, and poor Muslims at that. As soon as the Assam NRC was over, there was the Babri Masjid judgment, which made you think that this didn't look like justice. And, and we thought we would spend some time talking about that, campaigning against that. Uh, the, uh, and right after that was the announcement of the CAA. And, and, you know, that's fresh in everybody's memory since the 15th of December, the protests in Jamia, in Aligarh Muslim University, the beating up of students in JNU, the, pro the multiple peaceful protests led by Muslim women and uh, other women throughout the country, culminating in a kind of escalation of first verbal violence uh, with the Delhi. Uh, elections in Delhi and the kind of speeches that were given uh, by uh, BJP MLAs, uh, culminating in the violence that took place in Northeast Delhi. And 
so we we felt when the ca was announced that as a campaign uh, you know we we had to be at the forefront because it was a it was a very straightforward exclusion of minorities and that's what we were talking about um so for a while as you will all remember uh, there was actually uh, an atmosphere of solidarity in this country we were all talking about the constitution we were all celebrating the national flag we were singing the national anthem and it looked like we were entering a new era uh, you know a, a kind of renaissance uh, so to speak and um, very quickly after that after the violence uh, many many groups civil society groups and civil society itself rushed to the support of the victims of the violence in northeast delhi and just when the camps were kind of coming becoming stable came the threat of the corona virus and uh, with horror uh, we watched those camps uh, being dismantled overnight people being sent back uh, there was uh, you know we were watching the news in the about what happened in china italy england america and there was the impending lockdown in in india we even practiced for the lockdown one day in advance right uh, on the sunday what the way the lockdown has played out in our country actually that perhaps is the is the most shocking of all uh tuesday evening 8 o'clock a lockdown is announced and within 4 hours you've got 4 hours to midnight and all transport comes to a stop in this country all work comes to a stop the next morning millions there are about 400 million migrant workers there are about 800 million daily wage workers or even more because it's an unorganized sector people wake up to no work and for them no work means no food so and when when your response is okay i don't have any work where i have come to work i don't have a roof over my head because many of the migrant workers are homeless or they live in their places of work and can no longer live there and you say uh, there is a threat of disease there is uh, confusion and uh, you know rumors rife i must go home and we find uh, across this country millions and millions of people unable to go home and uh, you know it was just about 4 4 weeks ago that all those images were uh, all over social media we were from the security safety of our own homes watching these videos Uh, of people walking on foot uh, some of them lived in the neighborhood neighboring district some of them were walking 400 kilometers 800 1200 i mean it it was beyond imagination uh, that india would after lockdown indians would actually take to the highways with their uh, bags uh, their children uh, men and women uh, and and without food that you know the nothing is open on the way uh, without any uh, support and the threat of police violence actually attempt to go home so within uh, 24 hours we were looking we knew that we were looking at an impending humanitarian crisis and this time um, you know there was no exclusion it literally included so many groups that to our daily lives had become invisible and suddenly we are saying if the rickshaw wala doesn't have work how is he going to support his family if the the bank clerk if the for the staff in the school uh, you know the restaurant staff if these people are going to be out of work how are they going to sustain themselves so you know while immediately uh, civil society organizations appealed to the government for help we also realized that what we need to do is uh literally get on our feet and do something because we were staring at hunger and hunger doesn't wait how how many meals is a is a person going to skip i mean it's a it's the most gross human rights violation taking place here you know you don't have you don't know where the next meal is coming from uh so we felt compelled uh, as an organization as as in fact thousands of organizations across india have to stop whatever we were doing uh to forget about our deadlines and uh you know begin to take part in what we call the solidarity hunger campaign a solidarity feeding campaign uh, we had to respond 
to uh, you know, what we were watching around us. And that's how we found ourselves after years of rights-based work, actually literally uh, serving needs. So in, in other words, this is an extension of the work of the karma, extending a hand to those uh, who are struggling and those who have no other option uh, at this point in time. Uh, so, so would it be right to say that in your minds, this is no different from the work that you were doing earlier, that is to build harmony and solidarity in some way, um, but in this case, by delivering food and, and doing it with some form of dignity? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, what, you know, we, we were working, when we were working with lynch victims, uh, we could, you know, they were in the hundreds. When we were working with riot victims, they were in the thousands. And suddenly we skipped the lakh and went straight to the millions and possibly crores. Uh, but, but, but the fate of these people is the same. It is a people who have been forsaken by the state. It's a people who have been victimized by a state and are being treated as if they are the criminals. Uh, if they step out, they are beaten back. Uh, they have been uh, literally arrested on the highways. They have died on the highways. Uh, there are quarantine camps everywhere. Um, many, many, many people who uh, stepped out on foot have not reached homes. They have been uh, stopped in quarantine camps. And, you know, the injustice of it. What we are talking about is protecting ourselves with the lockdown. That's, that's the intention of the lockdown, right? That uh, even if it means a loss in profits, uh, the health of the nation, the health of the individual citizen of this nation is of great priority and we must protect ourselves by social distancing. But what have we left the poor in this country to do? Do they have the option of social distancing? And, you, you know, and you've taken away whatever little they had to sustain themselves. So it's, I mean, you know, serving meals seems like the kind of thing uh, Gurdwaras and temples used to do. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of charity, a social work. But at this moment, it's the, it's the basic minimum human right that you can uh, offer in solidarity to people who are stranded. And, and uh, not only are we serving meals, we are also writing about it constantly uh, in as many avenues as we can. We're making films, we're putting them out, we're doing a crowdfunding. So we're, we're trying to make as much of a noise, get as much attention to the plight of these people as we can with whatever resources we have. You make a very important point uh, that the poor are being treated as if they are criminals, uh, as if they are in conflict with law. Um, why do you think that is happening? We are in apathetic state. We, uh, we, you know, we are uh, we are not a working democracy. We have forgotten the ideals of socialism. We have forgotten what we have written in our own constitution, that, uh, that, the, that the responsibility of the state is to protect the most vulnerable citizen. And here we are sacrificing the most vulnerable citizen groups, communities, uh, for the welfare of very few, you know, of, of those who are anyway able to take care of themselves. And, I mean, look at the irony of this disease, of this infection, coronavirus, is something that has flown into this country via international flights. It's a disease that is affecting the affluent the most. If it is going to go through community transmission into uh, large numbers of, you know, large numbers of people in India are going to suffer, it's because they have come into contact with people who have traveled internationally. And those people to protect themselves, I mean, we have a right to protect, we all have the right to, uh, to health. Uh, the, the state often has to take drastic decisions and it has done that. But that drastic decision has a corollary attached to it. You know, we go to war, we don't abandon our soldiers. We take care of them. We make sure that they are protected. Uh, you know, we don't just throw them to die. But what have we done right now? Uh, it, it's, it's a war against a virus, we say. But, but who have we sacrificed? Uh, 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 you know, not only the entire labor force, but if you look at them in terms of families, it's a whole generation that is going to be scarred. 
So that's a that's a scathing indictment of uh, what is happening. Um, the the state uh, in some ways has abdicated its responsibility, and civil society is coming in. Um, but what are are you seeing any form of state civil society cooperation, especially in the existing uh, situation? Now that we're in the second wave, so to say, of the lockdown, um, what what is the response from the state in working with civil society groups like yourself, like the Karma? Uh, and and if there are areas where you find commonality, and if there are areas where you see some dissonance, uh, what would those be? So, um, you know, one of the finest examples of state civil society collaboration we are seeing in the state of Kerala. Yeah, uh, a state that um, had a large number of people flying in, flying back from the Gulf. Uh, very, very high cases uh, of coronavirus infection, but very early state intervention. Yeah, schools shut down in Kerala much earlier than they did in many other states. And a health minister, uh, the administration of the state, the chief minister of the state, working very closely on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with the community to make sure that no one goes, goes hungry, to make sure that enough testing is taking place, to make sure that the health workers are protected from infection. But in many other parts of the country, we are seeing an abdication on all, uh, you know, at many levels. Not only has the lockdown left uh, daily wage workers without any work and therefore without any um, a means to feed themselves. Uh, what is the state of our hospitals? What is the state of testing right now? Every day on social media, people are pleading for help. Um, by shutting down hospitals altogether, uh, there's, there's data that says 80,000 children, babies are born in India every day. Everywhere around us, <clears throat> in our neighborhoods, in nearby, uh, in our own uh, villages, uh, news comes in from there. On social media, uh, there are there's news of miscarriages. There is news of very badly botched up uh, birth because hospitals are, you know, you've shut down OPDs. Uh, women are left without any help. Uh, there are people who have had fractures. They're not being able to get help. Their blood banks are drying up. Diabetics. Heart patients uh, no longer have access to first aid. Cancer patients are suffering. Uh, doctors in names were up in arms. Besides that, people who are testing positive for corona, the kind of quarantine that they are being um, subject to, uh, the kind of death some of them are dying. I mean, at, at literally every level we have, we do not have the kind of modern day organization, modern day access to technology and uh, human resource that we actually have in this country. I mean, we've made a lot of progress. This is a country of scientists. This is a country that innovates. Uh, we, we are not, we, it's not that we don't have public health facilities, but the kind of panic that we have spread, the kind of uh, rumor mongering that is being allowed uh, add to that the Islamophobia that is being uh, promoted by mainstream media, uh, as, as well as the health ministry to some extent by giving out numbers uh, you know, of cases caused by uh, Marcus people. So what we, what we are left with, I mean, there's so much dissonance in a way, Risha. Uh, what we are left with, even when we are talking to each other, is, is there no glimmer of hope? Can it really be this bad? And and it's hard to convince yourself that it can be this bad and my life can still go on. So we, we, we don't know how to process the facts. I mean, journalists don't know how to process the facts. It's very few media organizations that are actually being able to day after day be able to report on both sides. You know, what is the advancement we are being able to make and where is it that uh, we need to really step up? And uh, the tragedy is that it's not because of resources. It's because we just don't seem to care enough. I mean, we've seen the videos of migrant labor entering Bareilly and being sprayed by the administration. You know, 
everybody knows that was not the thing to do. Everybody knows that didn't either protect those who were sprayed or others in the district. Why did we do that? The number of lynchings that have gone up, uh, deaths uh, because of police beating up that have gone up. Uh, these are uh, unconsciously. So uh, I, I, I picked up on two very interesting things that you've said. Um, one is that we are a country of innovators. We are a country that has some of the biggest IT, IT enabled services companies in the world. Um, yet uh, in this time, uh, no technology or no innovation, so to say, yet has come up which allows people to collaborate and work together uh, in a concerted manner to distribute uh, relief, uh, so to say. So what has been your experience uh, in, in working in concert uh, uh, you know, across various states? You, you work in Jaipur, you're working in Jharkhand, uh, you're working in Delhi and uh, you're working in, in several other states to, in UP to deliver uh, relief. And, and especially in some of these regions, uh, when I was reading through these are strife-torn regions that you're going to. How in the absence of technology uh, or any other such innovative means, are you discovering your own innovation? And tell us, uh, if you could tell the viewers here, uh, what is it to de deliver relief? What does it mean in these times? You know, a Swiggy or a Zomato is very easy when things are normal. But what does it mean in these times to deliver food to the most needy? What form does it reach uh, the ones who are most, you know, who are in most need of food? Um, okay, so there were several questions. Yes. Um, we are using technology. Uh, we are. Uh, um, I. I, but except that our uh, own seniors remind us that even before we had WhatsApp, uh, you know, even when they were uh, booking trunk calls to be able to talk from one state to the other, uh, and they had to respond to riots. I mean, Harsh is a veteran. We, you talk to your grandparents or your great grandparents at home, uh, people who have were involved in relief operations in 1947. Uh, my own father-in-law was. Um, it was also a time when, um, you know, there was a migration, mass migration of the kind that is happening today. Uh, it was caused by external factors, the government as well as civil society. It was a very new government. They didn't have the means or the resources. Civil society stepped in, camps were set up. Eventually, people had homes. Um, so even without technology, even without WhatsApp, even without phones, uh, relief, you know, when, when the intent is there, relief is, uh, relief work happens. Uh, we are actually, um, we, we're so, we've got the internet, right? I think we'll, we'll really truly uh, know what it means to be stranded when we lose the internet and, and if we lose our mobile connections. Because uh, in a way, WhatsApp, the same uh, forum that, that, is, that allows all of the fake news, and fake videos and fake rumors to travel is also the, the, the one um, a network that allows us to connect very quickly and, and the very minimal uh, energy, in a sense, to, to large groups. So because we are in a peculiar situation where uh, people are stuck away, far away from their homes, so it's, it's migrant labor that is largely uh, being victimized. Um, the uh, so there are people, for example, there are uh, labor from Jharkhand who are stuck, uh, some in Noida, in Greater Noida, in Delhi, in uh, Uttar Pradesh, in uh, Rajasthan, Gujarat, Kerala. Uh, there's a lot of migration out of states like UP, Bihar, and Jharkhand. So, uh, their uh, laborers are stuck in other states, they're calling home, they're calling their own villages and their own um, you know, sarpanch, who is getting in touch with his own DM or the local NGO, which is getting in touch with the NGO in the capital city, who are getting in touch with uh, organizations like Carvan or NAPM, because we've put out our numbers on the internet, uh, because our, um, uh, you know, it's via WhatsApp, our numbers have gone all over the place. So the news will go from, say, uh, a group of uh, migrant labor in Jharkhand, in Gujarat to their village in Jharkhand, it will come back via Lucknow to Delhi. 
Delhi will connect to an organization based in Gujarat and they will deliver the relief. So there's a lot of back and forth happening. Uh, a lot of WhatsApp groups are being used. Uh, there's a lot of 24-7 vigilance here. You know, our WhatsApp users are very tired by now. Uh, but it's something that is facilitating us to connect very quickly uh, with each other. Uh, how is the actual relief? What, what, what are the ways in which we are uh, doing relief? So when we started out, we didn't even have the resources. We didn't have any money in our accounts to be able to feed large numbers of people because that was not our core work. So while uh, the crowdfunding began to happen, we knew that we had to get the basic minimum across. So, and this is something that's kind of codified now. Many groups are doing that. We've created these uh, dry ration kits that include um, uh, wheat flour, rice, uh, dals, salt, sugar, oil, and a few basic masalas, uh, red chili and uh, turmeric. And, uh, and, and that's usually depending on uh, prices in different states about anything between 800 to 1200 rupees uh, you're able to buy enough dry ration to be able to feed a family of five for about 10 days so that's about 100 meals uh, for a thousand rupees um we uh, so so that's one one thing so dry ration kits are being uh, transported uh, and and handed over to people who are able to cook them the there are many many people uh, huge communities of people who are homeless they do not have the means to cook or uh, people who were uh, eating out of canteens. Yes, yes. And uh, I, 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 I would sort of, sort of break down this whole process. So you said uh, you're transporting dry ration kits, right? Is it, how easy is it to transport? Uh, what does it mean to transport dry ration kits in this time and what, how, what is the process of getting all of this together in these times? It's 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 complicated. Uh, it's it's a complicated process because uh, lockdown, right? So lockdown means that we cannot uh, that the wholesalers are no longer um, functioning. The whole wholesale market is has actually been locked down. So what we found was that um, uh, you know large um, organizations that actually deal with this, uh, so say Big Bazaar, Reliance. We, we spoke to them first, but uh, they were not able to, because of their own internal processes, which, are, which do not allow them to move very quickly and innovate very quickly. They were not able to, without advanced payments and without generating invoices, uh, you know, move a large amount of food. So we had to fall back on multiple um, uh, multiple individuals who were uh, being able to source and we've known that this person is going to run out so we need another person uh, we started with six passes the Delhi government gave us six passes because uh, as an organization uh, center for equity studies is already running homes for the homeless so we you know so we we, we were part of essential services uh, to some extent we used those six passes to actually run six vehicles three times a day with, with different teams throughout the day, 18, 19 hours in a day. So that sometimes we have reached a homeless community and woken up people and said, your food is here. Because it's that late, that close to midnight by the time we've actually reached there. Uh, so, you know, lockdown means you can't have enough volunteers. Lockdown means uh, you can't have enough people on the roads. Lockdown means that there is uh, the police to navigate with. Uh, so the numbers are actually uh, much, much lower in terms of how much we're being able to do. But, but, but we're still doing it. We've still got volunteers. People have, uh, what volunteers who are doing this work, many of them are not going back home. So we've got an office where they're all living together because, because they're going out throughout the day and meeting many strangers, they may pick up the infection at any point in time, they're risking their lives. So, they, so if they go back home, that, that's a problem. So many of our, most of our volunteers, in fact, are actually living in the office uh, in their own group. And uh, uh, so, so that's how dry ration kits are going. We are getting calls from most of the low income uh, colonies in Delhi the number of calls are escalating. Uh, if 
to uh, 15 days ago, we were getting 200 calls a day. We are now getting 600 calls a day. People who had food for the first four weeks are now running out. People are scared. Uh, many people have now been told that they do not have the job that they had. Uh, it's taken, you know, so uh, a sense of not having anywhere to go back, even when lockdown lifts. Uh, that that's a problem. Uh, so that's dry rations. The homeless communities need cooked food. So community kitchens are cooking food and uh, that's being delivered. That's also being done on a large scale by the Delhi government. But you've seen uh, yesterday scroll had a, a video of uh, migrant labor standing in queue. And these were only men. All of them were able-bodied men. All of them were men, uh, young men. Uh, and th that the queue of uh, them waiting for one meal was two kilometers long. So they actually took that video from a car and the car drove for two kilometers. That queue went on. And if you look at who is excluded, there are no women in that group. So how are they getting their meals? Where are the children? Where are the older people? Where are the disabled people? Um, those are the people that we are trying to reach. You know, which is why we say last in line, trying to reach the last in line. In many uh, places, we can't reach, uh, we can't send dry ration, we can't reach ourselves because they're remote uh, and lockdown does not allow that kind of mobility. So we have one team that is actually calling up the nearest Kirana store or the nearest ration shop. You know, we get their number and we say, well, this person is coming to your shop. Give him this dry ration kit and we'll make a Paytm or a, a phone pay or a Google pay a payment to you. So we are using technology uh, as it is available to us and it is actually facilitating things. But it's just the, the, the reality of what we are having to do. And if we are reaching a lakh people, we know that there are a million that we are not, you know, that, that there are hundreds of millions that we are not. So that is a, that however much you do, you get, you have that sinking feeling that so many others have uh, fallen into helplessness. So, so interestingly, uh, in, in this crisis, it seems that um, what you're not able to do sometimes takes over all that you're able to do. Uh, and that may be the overarching feeling uh, that one is left with as a volunteer. Uh, so as someone who's part of a large team of people who are essentially not uh, getting paid for this uh, and are doing this almost 24-7 uh, uh, in trying to make the various moving parts work, and that too not in one city but many cities, how are you keeping your spirits up? And by you, I mean you and your volunteers. And what are the challenges that you see there? Yeah, so uh, I mean, we're keeping our spirits up like like people do in crisis. You you have to play mind games with yourself. Uh, you have to group together, at, uh, you know, as a group. We have uh, Zoom meetings once a week where everybody comes on board. We give each other strokes. We remind each other uh, of how much we're doing, how little we were prepared for it, um, how much support and solidarity we are getting from others. So the number of volunteer requests that we are getting, the, the way in which um, uh, you know uh, people have made donations to keep the work going, the emails that we get where uh, people tell you, okay, I saw this film and I and I want to reach out to this person. Those are the things that you have to remind yourself, uh, you know, that you're doing uh, the best that you can, that it's temporary. And that you have to remember that when lockdown ends, when the threat of the virus is over, these are things we must never forget. We must never forget how unprepared we were as a state and as a society to be able to respond to just the threat of influenza among us. You know? uh, and, and that there are lessons here that must stay with us uh, forever. Right. Um, in, 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 you've been saying that you've been relying on individual generosity to keep things moving. You know, you reached out to a big bazaar and you reached out to other retail stores. You reached out to individuals who supported you. But for the last 
week or so, uh, we've been hearing news reports of the Food Corporation of India opening up its go-downs, uh, food, you know, food grains are being made available to nonprofits, and that you can buy it at a certain cost. Uh, why is it that you're not able... Are you able to access those things? Um, as an organization, we haven't yet accessed it, uh, partly because um, our processes are in place and we are able to get what would have cost 1,200 rupees in the market at about 8.30. Uh, so, we, you know, because we started working very early within 24 hours of the first lockdown, uh, we've kind of reached a place where we've got uh, not only donors, but also processes by which we are able to procure uh, in place. Uh, other organizations are working much more closely with the government uh, and uh, being able to uh, get their help. We, are, we also are working with the government in states like Jharkhand, for example. Uh, the government sends their lists and we send our lists. Okay. If we can't get it to someone, we send it to them. If they have people stranded somewhere, they can't reach, they send it to us. Um, so that kind of collaboration is going on. We are very, very uh, hopeful. We want to see far more uh, government action. We want to see uh, the government actually step in. Because to be honest, the lockdown may lift. But the economic crisis is going to last. It's going to last for a long time. The threat perception, the sense of fear, that's going to last a long time. And the best people, uh, with the you know people with the best resources to be able to communicate, to be able to reach out, remain the government, remain the people that we voted for. So there may be a glitch in their delivery, uh, but we are very very hopeful uh, that uh, they will step up and allow us to step back, uh, because uh, you know it, it's it, and we want to see that because that that would mean that we have. We have uh, righted some wrong, you know, that, that something has changed. We have become better uh, in terms of some systems. So to all our viewers who have just logged in, we are in conversation with Natasha Bhatwar from Karwai Mohapat. And you can keep uh, posting your questions on uh, YouTube, Twitter, wherever you're logged in from. We are live streaming across three or four platforms in Facebook, in YouTube, and in Twitter. Uh, one of the questions that's come to us is that is the solution a strong data platform which would allow you to uh, navigate the various needs much more easily? I know you've said uh, that you know you are you have some sort of flow or process set up, uh, you know some sort of codification that's happened. But do you think uh, that a better platform would make things much more easier? Um, I I don't think technology is the answer. Uh, I, I, and I, and I, I'm not saying no to a better platform. Uh, I, I mean, building platforms in this country, it, it doesn't take us more than 12 hours. Sometimes, uh, there are, there are a number of apps, uh, that are in place already, not only the government app, but many other apps created by people put in your data and, uh, it will reach somebody who will be able to deliver food to you. Uh, there are many websites that have been created which are collating all the organizations that are doing this work so that they are able to network with each other. And all of that is helping. But we have to recognize that the reason we are in this, uh, in this corner, we are the reason we are in a t at a time when so many amongst us are sleeping hungry is not because we lack the platform or the website. Or, or, or anything that technology could solve. It is that we did not use our resources well enough. We did not um, put enough pressure on our government to act a different way. We allowed ourselves to be distracted. So even in the cautious drawing rooms, the conversation is about, did the Muslims bring Corona uh, to India? Not about, uh, you know, what is the best way to do social distancing and um, bring the economy back on track? Or how is it that I can contribute towards uh, those in my own neighborhood who may be in need right now? So what we also need is, is, is you know, what if the platform is the heart, then uh, compassion, uh, you know, a sense of care, a sense of responsibility. 
you you spoke earlier on about the rise in hatred and violence even during these times and and now that you speak about the heart and you know the the kind of spirit that needs to come from people living in their own localities what is this rise in hatred doing to the spirit of solidarity and compassion that that all of us are trying to build in or you know uh, when we see on tv channels people walking for hundreds of kilometers what is this hatred doing to us and is it in some way impeding the efforts of hundreds of you who are on the streets trying to help people <clears throat> um, i i'm i'm still fairly optimistic i um, and and actually doing this work uh, is it 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 cheers me up you know it doesn't it doesn't pull me down on the contrary i if i if i feel um if i feel overwhelmed on any at any particular time i and i tend to sometimes say to myself maybe because i am coming face to face with violence and hatred and hunger uh that i am feeling so low maybe i need to take a break but i always discover uh constantly that taking the break that uh, taking the break is actually making me feel worse uh because when you're when you're doing something uh about what makes you feel bad you know when you convert your uh disappointment and your depression your uh, sadness into action uh you have sublimated it and and that action uh leads to some good certainly so <clears throat> while we are in the field doing this work uh, and they're doing it both online and offline because we're also doing a lot of campaigning awareness generation uh, there's no way people are going to uh, find who we are and be able to support this work with the resources it needs unless we talk about the work and the importance of this work so that's a that's a very big part of what the karwan does and what that does is actually puts us constantly in touch with people and and i know that's why you and i are talking right now it's because you you know you you were uh, you you saw some of that uh, and reached out so constantly in touch with people who are equally uh, upset who are equally disturbed by the state of things um uh, why but you know i i i i no longer take it personally that things are not so good in india because if you look across the political spectrum if you look across the geography of this world political systems are collapsing across the world england is not doing so well they did not manage their corona situation i mean they managed it really badly and they're suffering the fatalities america is suffering china has already suffered um india's i mean we've been very lucky uh, in terms of the the numbers uh, so far so we may not be in a good place but there are enough good people who want to fix this and uh while we are seeing constant rise in hatred while our own beloved media and i and, you know i'm a part of it i've worked in it i continue to work in it um is is itself uh, actually uh, becoming a, a hate monger is is actually allowing itself to be used as an amplifying platform but at the same time the alternate voices are also quite uh loud and times like these actually allow us to come together they also create a solidarity that um, earlier crises had not been able to so i mean if we look at our own experience um you know we've been running this campaign online as well as offline so our online presence uh, we were putting out films we were uh, writing about the lynchings and we almost felt like we were imposing our agenda or you know what hurt us on others and asking them for a reaction sometimes it felt like that because the number of people who engaged with that were so low then the caa protest started and people kind of you know came towards karwani mohabbat as if uh, like magnets because they knew of the work and now there was something that 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 resonated with them you know that they, they the numbers grew and with the virus with with the uh, the lockdown the numbers have you know they they've shot up so film our films are one of our films the one that we play right now it did more than a million uh, views on facebook and generated some of the largest chunk of um, funds 
for our work. So we're we're seeing both sides. And I think it's very important for people like us to process it very carefully, to not be allowed uh, to be pulled down <clears throat> with the narrative that hate is only rising and therefore the world is, uh, you know, it, it's not going to get better because we are seeing the better side as well in action. So as much as mainstream media would like us to believe that there is a villain, uh, we see there are so many heroes that are rising up to the occasion. Uh, so I want to go back to one of the questions uh, of the logistics, uh, which is, you know, you have volunteers who prepare dilation kits, you arrange for transport, you work with the police to get permissions, you, you find local contacts to, to make payments or to procure food from, and finally you reach the points at which you need to make deliveries. And often these are not just slums or slum dwellers, but these are homeless people who need you know, cooked food. Uh, these might be organized labor that has now been rendered destitute in some way. Um, how often has it happened that you, know, you might have reached with a certain assumption of need uh, and, and you know, the reality is totally different. So you have food for 20 people, but in the end, you need you probably there are a thousand people waiting there. How do you deal with that? Yeah, so that's been a learning. That's certainly been our experience. Um, we have actually uh, the very small group amongst us called the Hosla group. Uh, are there people? Uh, they're a team that have been working with the homeless uh, for many years now, and they've been working across the uh, across cities. Uh, in Patna, in Hyderabad, in uh, Delhi as well. Um, and so all the lawyers amongst us and the media people amongst us are, you know, for us now, our mentors are the team that actually work with the homeless day in and day out because they, they, they have developed the eye, they have de developed uh, the, um, the empathy to be able to see and tell who is it that is in the most need? So uh, for the first few uh, weeks, what we were doing was that we were actually doubling our uh, <clears throat> effort by first sending in a team that did a needs analysis. So one person uh, who knew how to do this, who, who was experienced, would go in in the morning. He would identify who is the community leader, who is the person who's likely to be my ally when I come to distribute. Who is the person who will take me into uh, uh, towards those people who are most in need, who can't come to my car, who can't come to the meeting point? <clears throat> and uh, this person has done a needs analysis in the morning. He'll be the you know, first. He'll do those rounds, and then second half of the day, the food will go. In the beginning, uh, this is what was working. What has happened now, four or five weeks down the line, is that the needs have magnified in a way that, that that is very, very hard to deal with. So not only people who do not know uh, where their next wage is ever going to come from, not only the daily wager and the homeless, but also the person who, ha who has been employed or who who's, might still have his job, but is running out, previous salary hasn't come, a next salary may not come, supplies have run out, cannot access um, their savings. I mean, those are the kind of people, people who have never stood in line uh, to ever ask anyone else for it. You know, so um, now it's, it's what we're dealing with for the last five days is a kind of magnification of need which is very, very, uh, very, very hurtful, very, very traumatic to deal with. So it is true that um, the number of kits that we are now creating every single day has um, gone up by about 50, 50 times uh, than what it was a week ago. If, if, we were, if we were going into a community with uh, 20 packets, we are now going into the same community with 200 packets. Um, because people have run out. I, I want to. I want to just ask that question again. You're saying the needs have amplified fifty times five zero. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, 
people who had enough food in their homes to carry on for a month are now uh, have have run out and those who are stranded uh, you know so there are um, there are so many hostels across the city i mean this is how you really also learn what is the map of the city that you're living in i have never known my neighborhood in the way that I, that we are now discovering uh, you know so many industrial belts so, these are all people with jobs they had absolutely fully functional lives but they've run out they they don't have any money to buy food anymore there are um, communities that are sealed so they have the money but they don't have the means they still need somebody to deliver dry food to them and noida has many of these uh, places um so yeah needs needs have amplified thankfully our fundraising uh i i is also continuing uh, it's not like it's saturated it's not like we're going to run out uh, we thought we were running a four week campaign we thought uh, you know that we could put a number and uh, we would uh, that would work but now we we have removed those numbers so our own keto campaign was 50 lakhs so then we made it 1 crore and then we made it 1.5 crore and uh, there are new campaigns starting they're going to we're going to keep at it because uh, the the scale of the need is really really unimaginable so uh, to our viewers i want to say that uh, the karwai mohabbat is not an organization but it is a platform for like minded citizens to come together uh, natasha has been speaking about the various groups and subgroups and organizations Uh, that are part of it so just to make it uh, clear to all our audiences the center for equity studies aman biradri hosla all of these are smaller groups within the larger sort of umbrella of karwai mohabbat uh, which has been i'm sorry rainbow rainbow homes uh, which is part of uh, the larger umbrella of karwai mohabbat working with homeless communities uh, com- uh, you know people affected by communal violence Uh, and people on the margins uh, of our society and and it is this work that has allowed the kawan to reach uh, some of the most vulnerable and dispossessed people uh, in the country um, there there's a there's a there's a reson- there's a recurring theme uh, when you when you speak natasha about people who are going down a notch with every passing week with every passing day so those who had food now have no food and can't go out those who had uh, you know a home in their villages are not able to go back home and are now on the streets uh, and those uh, who were on the streets absolutely have nothing to look forward to so despite the individual heroes despite the solidarity despite the amount of love and care that we've been able to garner from fellow citizens we can the we suffering can, continues to increase the, the suffering exactly. continues to increase and it it does seem very clearly that once this lockdown period is over we will be faced with a new set of vulnerabilities where we may not be able to make an urgent call for fundraising uh, or an urgent appeal to people uh, because you know people stop giving money when the waters recede from a flood people only give money when the flood is ongoing what would yeah. what 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 would you say to that and how do you think the road ahead looks yeah so before we end i also want to play a very short video uh, where in which harsh goes out and meets some people on the streets <clears throat> uh yeah that that uh, it's a very very important point that you've raised uh which is why we have to understand that the the crisis is not the crisis of technology it's not the crisis of supply chain it's not uh, a crisis of a lockdown or a virus even the crisis is a crisis of the entire system and of our own understanding of how what the design of the world uh, what what is sustainable design of the world is when this suffering increases and it is going to um industry will suffer it's it's not like the migrant labor will go through uh, you know a series of setbacks and it will not have an effect on 
the place uh, places that have employed him and then will not have an effect on the people who own those places or run those places or who have big fat salaries coming from the same places our education system is going to uh, need rehauling our children are going to have to be are going to learn a, a new way of living i mean the uh, so at at one level we ha- we have to those of us who are at the forefront who care enough to contribute towards uh, you know feeding solidarity who care enough to volunteer for this have to care enough to want to change fundamentally the structure of how governance is happening of how our economies are being run how our education is designed we we have to be looking at uh, a fundamental change that is very important which is why the, that was the karwa's work before we got into feeding solidarity it is going to remain the karwa's work after we do that and and in a way the caa protests uh they kind of threw up some of the best uh, and most important issues of our time yeah it, it it brought back the constitution into our into our consciousness because here in a fundamental way in the preamble we have written what is it that the world should look like what is it that this country should look like and all of us were hurting most of us were hurting when that fundamental uh, basis of the of of what it makes what what makes us indian was shaken at its foundation um and those are the kind of values that we have to begin to recognize we have to know that our lives are interconnected interdependent you cannot watch one community go down and expect that it will not hurt you later we had a lynching in maharashtra yesterday a hindu community lynched three hindu men this is this is this is coming very close to home for everybody and it's not only threat a sense of threat to our lives that should be moving us it should be a whole value system of uh, you know of, of putting humanitarianism to the forefront in a sense so it is about humanitarianism it is about uh, building building a sense of solidarity and it is about recognizing that none of us can go down all of us have to rise up together thank you so much for being with us today and speaking to us and explaining to us what it means to be feeding those and it's not just um, feeding that you're doing but literally building uh, a community of people who will rise up to the occasion so i'll request the team to play the video and uh, thank you so much for this conversation हाँ अगर बीमारी होगी तो भूख के मारे बीमारी नहीं होगी इन सबको बताइए आप ये कहाँ पे जाएंगे सब अलग अलग प्रांत के हैं ना इनको छत छुपाने की जगह बारिश आए तो ना सोने की जगह सब ऐसे ही बेचारे और इधर पुलिस मारती है देर आर ओवर फोर हंड्रेड मिलियन माइग्रेंट वर्कर्स इन इंडिया सिक्योरिटी ऑफ स्टेबल एम्प्लॉयमेंट मेनी ऑफ दम आर डेली वेज लेबर विद नो होम इन दिटी हम बेटा भूखे पड़े बेटा हमारा कोई नहीं बेटा यादगार कोई नहीं बांटने आता The 21 day lockdown to contain the spread of coronavirus has left millions of Indians stranded, jobless and hungry. Our country uh, is facing probably its biggest crisis uh, since partition and before that the great bengal famine of 1943 as our governments uh, and the people of india fight uh, this pandemic the large majority of indians do not have a job for which they will be paid a salary for sitting at home they don't have a home at all or if they have a home they don't have a home which allows any kind of social distancing they don't have a regular supply of water with which they can wash their hands sar ko raccha karo kaha to lag ye bhooke pyaase mar jayega dukane band hai paise bhi nahi jo khareed ke kha lenge kaisa din aa gaya dihadi bhi nahi mil rahi kya kare sir baithe hue 
Faced with uncertainty and weeks of unemployment and hunger, migrant workers have taken to walking on highways, trying to reach their homes. 22 people, including five children, have died in their desperate attempt to reach home. In many sites, we are seeing hunger uh, emerging. We are seeing people already desperate for food. तारीख से हमने रोटी के सकल नहीं देखा जो कि इसी हाथ से रोटी बना के देने वाला आदमी हम कारीगर इंसान हैं मैं नहीं बत्तरे कारीगर है और मैं बत्तरे में जगह नहीं है ना बोलता है जो कितने हैं उतने ही हैं बोल रहे हैं अब आगे आदमी नहीं बोलने देंगे मार दे डंडों और दाल और चावल आते हैं इतने जो अंदर हैं उन्हीं को मिलते हैं वो भी थोड़े-थोड़े हम लोग डेली मजदूरी वाले बाबूजी आदमी हैं हम जहाँ काम करते हैं वहाँ डेली मजदूरी लेते हैं जो भी 500-600 मिलते हैं लेकिन मैं डेली लेता हूँ फिलहाल होटल बंद नहीं इसलिए मजबूरी में पड़ा मजबूरी जगाड़ा रहना पड़ता है आर इज ऑलवेज टू हैव अ टीम व्हिच विल गो आउट विद दिस कुक मीन्स एंड ड्राई राशंस फॉर दोस हु have nobody so do join uh, in your own way uh, in our enterprise or create your own each of us all of us citizen groups keeping our own health protected produce enough food for our brothers and sisters uh, who are poor and who are hungry and who are devastated uh, by a lockdown for which they have no responsibility whatsoever. So let us stand with our brothers and sisters uh, uh, in this time of distress together.